Good morning. This morning's altar flowers are for the celebration of organ donors. This morning we also celebrate the one year anniversary of my heart transplant, or as Cam and Gage call it, or as Cam and Gage call it, my heart anniversary. <laughs> While we celebrate this medical miracle of life, the donor family is remembering a different anniversary. I believe that faith is a private arrangement between you and God. I think we all take our faith for granted until certain death or the hope of a life-saving procedure plays on your mind. In my case, my heart was failing. A normal heart has an ejection factor of 70 to 60 to 70 percent. Mine was 7 percent. There was no discussion. There were no options. There was no plan B. The only thing that would save my life was a heart transplant. Faith is a double-edged sword. While one family prays for a new heart, another family is praying a heart doesn't fail. When it comes to life and death, I believe I'm a realist. From dealing with my father's death as a teenager to my 30 years as a paramedic, I have witnessed life and death close up. I think faith allows you to accept what we can't understand and remain strong to continue on. Faith and trust in our Savior allows us to prepare for whatever the outcome. Because we know there will be good outcomes and not so good outcomes. That's just the way it is. And faith takes away the fear of planning and preparation. Business stuff, personal stuff, family stuff. I plan my funeral, music selections and all. But faith also allows you to trust not only in God, but your family, your friends, the doctors, nurses, and hospital staff who take care of you during this medical miracle of life. In the words of Martin Luther, faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace, so certain of God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. Such confidence and knowledge of God's grace makes you happy, joyful, and bold in your relationship to God in all creatures. Even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I feared no evil, for he was with me. Please join me in standing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn in anger, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. 
we exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living our Christ's justice and spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. We will sing verses 1 and 3 of the trumpet sound. today comes from the second chapter of 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho draw near to Elisha, near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken up from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept walking and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Today's psalm is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One... 
God the Lord has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence, with a consuming flame before and around about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness to the judgment of people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteous of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. The second lesson today comes from the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let the light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Please stand to hear the good news. The Holy Gospel is written in the ninth chapter of Mark. Glory to you, O Lord, the Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. There appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. From the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, immediately, straight away, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Reading a book that talks about oaths or vows. And one of the lines in the book is, you should never make an oath. You should never make a vow or such a sacred promise unless you're willing to keep it until your last breath. I thought that was profound on such a day as this. My cousins reminded me over 20 years ago, uh, my aunt and uncle, their mom and dad, got remarried, renewed their vows, and I was there for that. But what I didn't know or what I didn't hear is my aunt and uncle saying, does she want to marry me again? Does he want to marry me again? You would think after... 40 years together, decades together, you would know one another and there would be no doubt that you wanted to celebrate your love and renew those vows. But how humble is this greatest gift that God gives to us? And we know we're not worthy. We know we don't love perfectly. We know we're not in the perfect friendships. And yet God continues to bless us, anoint us, give us opportunities to share. 
and be renewed by God's very presence. So I'd like to give you the opportunity in the tabernacle of Almighty God, the source of our love and friendship, to be renewed. If you like, repeat after me. In the presence of God and all living creatures, I promise to love you, care for you, be there with you, in thickness and in thin, in good times and bad times, in sickness and in health, till my last breath. Amen. Now, if friendships need renewal, repeat after me. In the presence of God and all living creatures, I promise to listen. hear you, converse, disagree, but to be faithful and loyal as your friend until my last breath. Amen. We can be fooled and deceived to take these vows, take these oaths, take these promises as just words or just words. But then in the presence of God, we're gathered as his children to be renewed and restored in such a way that God's divinity, God's light, God's very presence is made clear and overwhelms. Not for us to look good, who here loves perfectly, is a friend perfectly. It's for God's glory that we love and have friendships. So we enter in to the mercy of God's covenant. Sealed by a sacrifice. What sacrifice is it? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is through his death and resurrection that we are given the mercy to enter in to a covenant of love, of promise, of giving and gifting. That's the love we celebrate. We have a Lord that looks out for us in such a way, renews us, in such merciful ways so that we can let others know how much he loves us and loves them. The threats to these relationships and the covenant is real. I was thinking back when I only had three TV channels and the TV went off with the flag. Remember that? At night, how different things are. And even back then, when I was so deprived, I couldn't even get the channel to watch Glow. I'd watch too much TV, and my mom would discipline me. She'd come down and say, turn that blasted thing off. And out of love and out of discipline, some of my brothers and sisters need to hear those very same words. We need to turn the blasted thing off and be focused on the word of God in Christ Jesus and the covenant that is open to us and sealed by a sacrifice. Turn off, turn away from these powerful influences that want to destroy the covenant of love with God and God's living creatures. Wants to destroy our friendships and ruin them. These powers are real. 
And they are overwhelming, brothers and sisters, from this generation and all generations. The time is now to be renewed in love and friendship in such a way as to share God's transfigured presence. Whether you're up on a mountain or suffering in the valley, the shadow of death, the renewal is the same. There are many ways in the rich history of Christianity to celebrate the Sundays leading up to Lent. Lent will begin Wednesday. There'll be a service at 11. There'll be a service at 7, God willing. But do not enter Lent without being renewed and restored in the covenant of God's loving purpose for our lives. Second Corinthians, you heard the text. There's a veil of disbelief. The trust and the faith is destroyed, not only between us and God, but between me and you. Because of this veil of disbelief and distrust, this veil of ignorance and blindness, and that's caused by a power that wants to destroy and take away the covenant of God's children with their creator and our friendships with one another. This power is real. And it is causing tremendous pain and suffering. And we're blind and don't even hear it, don't even see it, and sometimes aren't even aware that it exists. Think of how blind the apostles were, the 12. And they lived with Jesus Christ. How much more blind are we? So many generations removed from touching him, hearing him, being with him. And yet his presence is promised the same. James, the first of the 12 to be martyred and die in sharing his love for Christ Jesus and for his friends. John, the last one of the 12 to be alive. And Peter, on this rock, I will establish my church. Peter holding the keys. None of them love Jesus perfectly or one another without fighting as friends and brothers. Naomi and Ruth, you remember? Sticking together. No matter what, not because things were easy, not because things were right, not because they were perfect, but sticking together. That's following Jesus Christ. That's following in the covenant of God's mercy. Elijah and Elisha in 2 Kings. How many times did Elijah tell Elisha, stop, stop following me. Stay here. Elisha would not listen to his mentor. Would not listen to the one he was following in the hopes of getting a glimpse of this covenant love. He wouldn't let it go. He wouldn't sacrifice it. That's what friends and brothers and sisters do. In the name of God Almighty, we stick together. You can't separate us. Because the love of God in Christ Jesus will never be defeated or separated. It's not my power. It's not your power. It's not our say so. It's God's say so. Through his death and resurrection, the sacrifice which seals the covenant of our relationship with God and all living creatures. How tremendous is that? Can you picture Elijah striking the water like Moses and the staff? Elijah strikes the water Jordan with his mantle and it divides 
That's the power of God. Doing the unspeakable, the unthinkable, the miraculous. Life-giving moment. Elijah and Elisha, they cross over into that outer land. Outside the promised land. Where Moses himself is buried. The prophetic tradition. The priestly tradition of the law. They cannot be separated. No more than the Old and New Testament can be separated. There is one witness. There is one God. The priestly. The law. Moses and Elijah are together. They enter into that land. And that's where the fiery angels, the seraphim, come down and take Elijah to heaven. Cherubim, angels of the ark, of the chariot, come down together and take Elijah to heaven. The only other person mentioned in the sacred scriptures who didn't die, Enoch. So Elijah is of a very select group. And God sends his angels, his messengers, the fiery ones. Do you remember what Jesus said just a few weeks ago to Nathaniel as Jesus was calling the first followers? He says, don't be amazed at me knowing so much about you. You're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see the holy ones, the angels, with the Son of Man descending and ascending. Like our gospel text, keep me being the Messiah, me being God, to yourself for now. People won't understand. They won't believe you. It'll cause confusion. There is a veil. There's an ignorance. There's a, a lack of faith. People don't believe. So don't tell them yet until the Son of Man is risen. What is it that you're facing that is causing your ability to make true your vow, your promise, your oath, causing it to fail? Remove it. God have mercy. Lord have mercy. Remove that which is not helpful in keeping my promises to you and to one another. Before I enter into following you in this Lenten journey, make me renewed to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. We profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived with the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the offering.
Let us pray together. O God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, empowering us in faithful service, tending to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace, amen. Please prepare the elements for Holy Communion. to be fully present to our risen Lord. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me, the body of Christ given for you. Again, after supper, our Lord Jesus, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me, the blood of Christ shed for you. Remember us in your kingdom, dear Lord, teaching us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Together we pray. Christ Jesus, at this very table, we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your holy name. Amen. God, the creator, strengthen us. Jesus, the beloved, fill us. The Holy Spirit, the comforter, keep us in peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace as the light of Christ. Thank you.